So 2 Chronicles 32, if you would please stand in honor of God's word. So my favorite, favorite scripture, this topic is phenomenal, and I'm, I'm going to try to fit in as much as I can, but I got a lot of stuff to cover, so y'all got to listen quickly. He, the king of Assyria, wrote also letters to rail on the Lord God of Israel And to speak against him, saying, As the gods of the nations of other lands have not delivered their people out of my hand, so shall not the God of Hezekiah deliver his people out of my hand. Verse 18 of 2 Chronicles 32. Then they cried with a loud voice in the Jews' speech unto the people of Jerusalem that were on the wall to frighten them and to trouble them that they might take the city. And they spoke against the God of Jerusalem as against the gods of the people of the earth, which were the work of the hands of man. And for this cause, Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, prayed and cried to heaven. And the Lord sent an angel, which cut off all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and the captains in the camp of the king of the Assyria. So he returned with shame on his face in his own land. And when he was coming to the house of his God, they that came forth of his own bowels slew him there with the sword. In other words, his own children assassinated the king of Assyria when he went home and went to his own church, okay? Boom! Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we love you so very much. Thank you, God, for these scriptures and how they just share with us the victorious life that we should be living. God, I pray that we will not allow Satan to rob us of our joy, that we will not allow him to keep us on a plane beneath our privilege where we act like paupers instead of being the children of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God, lift us up, please. I pray, oh God, that we will begin to trust in you, that we'll fall deeper in love with you, And God, that you will be our strength and our refuge. It's these things I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. For the next few minutes, I'm going to give you a recap of the first 15 years of the reign of good King Hezekiah. Now, if you'll remember, Hezekiah... His father's name was Ahaz, and Ahaz reigned for 16 years. Ahaz was a very, very bad king. Um, For 16 years, he he introduced idolatry all throughout the land. They set up altars to idols. In fact, in the temple itself, they moved the altar of burnt offering away and put in a fake from Damascus that, that was just an abomination. They turned the temple of God into a garbage heap. They stopped all the ministry inside the house of God and eventually just shut the doors and had Sabbath no more. So Hezekiah, when he becomes the king, the the Bible says on the first day of the first month of the first year that he begins to reign, he begins to make reforms and he goes in and begins to repair the house of God. And he gathers around him some of the Levitical priesthood, and he says, it's time to clean up the house of God. We're going to go in there, and we're going to clean out all the trash. We're going to repair the altars. We're going to put everything back where it's supposed to be. We're we're going to start lighting incense on the table of incense. In other words, we're going to start a prayer ministry. We're going to light the golden candlesticks, which means evangelism. We are going to repair the table of showbread, uh, which speaks about the word of God. And we're going to fix these things that have been in ill repair. And the Bible says they begin to fix these things. And people begin to bring sacrifice and a revival breaks out. People start getting excited about God again. And they begin to destroy some of the altars and the idols that are all throughout the land. And, 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 and God is doing some mighty things in their life. So it, it gets to going so well that uh, at the time of Passover, they send a letter up to Israel, the northern kingdom, and say, listen... We're getting excited about Jesus, 
And, and we want y'all to come down here and celebrate the Passover with us. Now, at first, the Bible says that the Israelites begin to mock them of Judah, but then they say, you know, that's a pretty good idea. We're going to go down there. And they go down there, and literally thousands upon thousands of people join them to celebrate the Passover. And we know what the Passover is. That's a picture of Jesus because Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. Amen? Great things, exciting things. The Bible goes on to say that even when they're having this spiritual renewal, that throughout the land, Bible studies are getting started again. People begin to pray again when they'd stopped. They observe the Sabbath day as a day of worship. And then once they get the basics straightened out in their life, then God begins to give them victories in spiritual warfare. In fact, in 2 Kings 18, 8, the Bible says he smote the Philistines, that, that ancient enemy of them. That, that The Bible says under Ahaz, the Philistines had beaten up on the people of Judah, but now under Hezekiah, they're winning the war. And they, and they smote the Philistines. The Bible also says that they tell the king of Assyria, we're not giving you nothing else. We're not paying you any tribute. We're not giving you any taxes. We're not under you. We're not going to do what you tell us to do. We're free as far as that's concerned. Thank you very much. Go mind your own business. And they have these great victories, okay? Now, I want you to picture this because the Bible says that the Old Testament temple of God is a picture of a New Testament believer. In other words, you are the New Testament temple of God. So that when we see Hezekiah cleaning out the trash out of the temple, that's a picture of a New Testament believer repenting of sins in their life. Of coming to the altar and saying, you know, God, I've been watching something on TV that I wouldn't watch if you were in the room with me. And I'm going to stop. Lord, I've been saying some words coming out of my mouth, curse words that if you were standing in the room, I would not say, I need to stop that. I, I need to get some of the trash out of my life. There's some things I'm doing that I don't need to be doing. And it's a picture of repentance when they clean out the Old Testament temple. It's a picture of cleaning out the New Testament temple, which is us. Amen? And it's like saying, you know, I used to have a Bible study, but I didn't have one. I, I'm going to start studying the Bible. I'm going to start praying. I'm going to get me a prayer journal. And when somebody says, would you pray for me? I'm going to write their name down. And I'm not going to just say it, but I'm going to actually do it. And I'm going to start praying for the lost. I'm going to start praying for my Sunday school teachers. And I'm going to start praying for our staff and, 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 and for those people I work with. And, and I'm going to start praying. I know it's the right thing to do. I've talked about it long enough. It's time to start doing it. And you start doing it. And when you do that, when you do that and start getting serious about your faith in Christ, then what you've done is you've raised the battle flag against the devil. Amen? So it's almost like you went in and you just poked him in the eye real good. But you know as well as I do, that's just round one. The fight's not over. The devil doesn't take a vacation, does he? No, no, no. You got 15 rounds to fight. And as you look over on the other side, he's not over crying. Instead, he's getting mad. And you know the worst is yet to come. You just got through round one or round two of these little bitty fights, but the big one's coming. And, and, and for Hezekiah, he knew that he was not done with Assyria because the Bible says in the fourth year of his reign, suddenly the Assyrian king, who is Shalmaneser, comes down and attacks Israel, his northern neighbor. The Bible says that they lay siege around the city of Samaria for three years. It's a horrible siege. And finally they take the city and they take the country and there is no more Israel after that. It's gone. Assyria is now on the northern border of Judah. Woo! Can you imagine that if Russia were to attack Mexico and were to occupy Mexico and the Russian army was stationed along the southern border of the United States of America? That's the picture that it has here. And you're going, you know, a fight's about to come. A fight's about to come. And you need to think about that in spiritual matters. You, you may have done good on the first couple of battles against the devil, but I've got news for you. He's not done with you yet. So if you run up the battle flag against him, there's a bigger fight coming. Amen? Then the Bible comes up and says, In the 14th year of Hezekiah, 
that now the leader of the Assyrians is a guy by the name of, get this, Sennacherib. That's how you say it. I love saying that. I was going to name my third child Sennacherib, but God didn't give me that one. <laughs> the king of Assyria attacks the border cities of Judah. It's like if the Russians were down in Mexico and suddenly they begin to attack Brownsville and Laredo and El Paso and San Diego. Whoa. Man, it'd be something, wouldn't it? So we've got to ask ourselves, okay, here's, here's the, the first outline for the sermon. Hezekiah begins to compromise with the enemy. So when they come and attack those border cities up on his northern border, the Bible says he writes to them, and this is what he says. He said uh, in 2 Kings 18, 14, he sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish saying, I have offended you. Oh, please return from me. Leave me alone. That which thou puttest on me I will bear. And the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house. And all that Hezekiah did, he cut off gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord, from the pillars which Hezekiah, the king of Judah, had overlaid. And he gave it to the king of Assyria to compromise with the enemy. Hezekiah began to strip away things from the house of God. Wow, what a picture of Christians that start having problems in their life. One of the first things they usually do is they begin to compromise their faith just to get the devil to leave them alone. Well, I'll give up my Sunday school class. I'll quit going to worship on Sunday nights. I'll quit the tithing. Just leave me alone. And we do things to try to compromise at work. It's, it's that, okay, fine, I'll go to the clubs with, 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 with these people just to get along with them. And you begin to compromise your faith in different areas. But compromising with the devil never works. You understand his goal is to destroy you. To rob you of your joy. To steal your freedom. Your victory. Truly the Bible says the thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And one of these days you will wake up and you'll realize if you want your freedom in Christ, your victory in spiritual warfare, if you want your joy back, you've got to stop compromising with the devil. You've got to quit playing with him. You've got to quit trying to make deals with him. Sennacherib, here's the thing. Sennacherib took the gold and he still didn't stop. He said, that's not stopping me. I'm still going to invade Judah. <laughs> I'm just going to do it with a pocket full of gold. Second thing, Hezekiah figured out it wasn't going to help to compromise with the enemy, so he made a commitment to the Lord, which is what he should have done in the first place. So the Assyrian army shows up, and they lay siege to the city of Jerusalem. Encircle it, cut it off. They can't get in or out, and they begin psychological warfare. The Assyrians were wonderful at this. And what they would do is they would get on a loudspeaker and they would aim it at the wall and they did not speak in Assyrian. They spoke in the Jewish language is what the Bible says. And they began to holler at the wall going, you might as well surrender. If you surrender, we will be nice to you. We will be your friend. If you do not surrender, we will kill you. We will torture you. Oh, your God cannot save you. No other gods have saved anyone else. Your God cannot save you. You have a pitiful God. Therefore, you should surrender. Your walls are not strong. Your army's not strong. Surrender. And they would take captives and they would pull them out in front and go, this is what we would do to you if you don't surrender. And they would start cutting their heads off and peeling the skin off of them and torturing them. And the people on the wall are going, ah. And it was psychological warfare. And the Bible goes so far as to say that what they did was they got a letter and, and they, they sent it to Hezekiah. And in the letter it said, if you don't surrender, we will destroy your city. Just like we did Samaria. Your God cannot save you. Our God is more powerful than your God. You might as well give up. And, and, and Hezekiah got the letter, and the Bible says he went to the preacher, Isaiah, and they said, what do we all do? So we all pray about it. So they went to the house of God. They laid the letter on the altar, and they laid it right there, and they said, God, do you hear what he's saying about you? 
I wouldn't take it if I were you. He said he can whoop you, God. I don't think he can. Why don't you show me how bad you're going to beat that king of Assyria? They laid it at the altar, and they prayed before holy God, and they committed themselves to God by saying, we trust you, we believe in you, and all our faith and hope are in you. Now, here's what I need you to do. I need you to take your Bibles, and I need you to turn over to Psalm 46. Because after they prayed this prayer, they wrote a song. And they taught it to all the people of Jerusalem. And this became the number one hit in the top ten music that was being played on the radio. And this song talks about the attitude of the city. So Psalm 46 begins by saying, to the chief musician for the sons of Korah, or the choir members, a song upon Alamoth. I'll explain that in a minute. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Psalm 46, verse 3. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. He shall not be, she shall not be moved. God will help her and that right early. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Now, the chorus of this song is verse 7, and then I believe verse 11, which continues to repeat, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. So what they're doing is they are singing a song. Now, there are three great truths in this. Here are the great truths. First of all, they're saying, we trust in God. Our God is with us. He is here. He's going to help us. The Assyrians were hollering, the walls can't save you. And your army's not strong enough. You don't have enough weapons to beat us. And the Jews reply, you're right. Our walls aren't big enough. We don't have a big enough army. Our weapons are no good. But we're not trusting in our wall and we're not trusting in our army. We're trusting in our God. And he, he's in here with us. And our God's going to whoop you good. They literally said, it's not our walls you need to be worrying about. It's our God you need to be worrying about. So that's what they're singing. Are you with me? Do you understand what it means for you to be able to say, God is with me? That the very name of God is Emmanuel? God with us, that when you gave your heart to Christ, that the Holy Spirit came to dwell inside you, that you carry the omnipotent, almighty God of this universe with you everywhere you go? Does that not give you confidence that when the devil comes up and goes, ah, I put him up, you go, oh, 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 man, my God, I'll knock you out. He's already done it. He's going to do it again. All I'm going to do is stand back and watch. And they said, listen, the one you better worry about is the one that's not going to kill your body, but going to kill your body and your soul. Our God is with us, and we trust in him. Second, and this is really good, we have refreshing water. Listen to verse 4 of Psalm 46. There is a river. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. So the Assyrians are shouting, we have you surrounded. We've cut you off. You have no water. You have no food. And what they did not realize is that when Hezekiah heard that the Assyrians were coming, that he got engineers and they went to what was called the Gihon Springs, the source of water for the city of Jerusalem. And they cut through solid granite from the pool of Siloam to the Gihon Springs, 1,777 feet, and they met in the middle. And if you go with us to Israel, you will go through Hezekiah's tunnel if you want to. Some don't want to. 
I've been through it twice. I'm going through it a third time. And even now, there's water flowing through it that's up to your knees or your waist of the most cold, refreshing, wonderful water you've ever seen that flows from the Gihon Springs underneath the city of Jerusalem down to the Pool of Siloam. So what they did not know outside the walls is that they had all the water they could want inside the city of Jerusalem. So look at the title. A song upon Alamoth. What does that mean? Well, it's talking about this song is really written for the sopranos. It's written for the, the ones that screech the loudest in the choir. That, that's, not a, that's not an insult. I'm saying that when, when one of those sopranos lets loose, brother, you can hear her, amen? And it was meant the loudest person in the choir is going to blow forth this one. And here's what they were doing. The high sopranos were singing with the choir. They were going, we have water. Yes, we do. We have water. How about you? <laughs> and the Assyrians have no water. Because Hezekiah said, why should they come to our land and have water? Any water they have, they're going to have to drag in from someplace else. And it'll be old, stale, brackish water. Whereas we've got flowing streams of all the water we could ever want. So they're up on the wall pouring water on their head going, ah, oh, ah. Oh. And the Assyrians are going, where are they getting the water from? We don't have no water. How they got water? We don't have any water. We want some water. They're wasting the water. And there's poor no one go, we got water, ooh, rivers of water that you know not of. Before they would go to a city and they would say, we're going to destroy you. And people on the walls would tremble in fright. Not in Jerusalem. They're saying, we got God. <laughs> but you have no water. Oh, we got lots of water. <laughs> So they're writing back to the commander going, these people are crazy. We, we've done all the psychological warfare. They're laughing at us. We've tried to cut off their supplies. They're wasting, they're pouring water over their head on the walls. They got rivers of water. But out of you should come rivers of living water that the world knows not of. That when the chips are down and Everybody's saying, oh, woe is me, that you're going, oh, not me. No, no, no. You know, in Vacation Bible School, we used to sing a song that said, I have a river of life flowing out of me. It makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison's gates, it sets the captives free. I have a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up, oh, well, goose, 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 down in my soul. Spring up, oh, well, splish, splash, and make me whole. Spring up, oh well, whoosh, and give to me that life eternally. Y'all remember that song? <laughs> Jesus said, in the last day of that great feast, he stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water that the devil knows nothing of. Then when he comes to you and says, you're a dirty, rotten red, you're going, ah, <laughs> my God is with me, and I have rivers of living water you know nothing of. Y'all, do y'all like our sign? Our sign out, outside, you know, it has the three rocks and, and the cross, and, and out of it comes a, a river, river of Flint. It literally is from Flint comes rivers of living water. Flint? It's kind of a play on words, and, and it was a rock that water came out of, but it's, not, but it's also out of Flint. We're Flint. You, out of this church should flow rivers of living water that everybody goes, where do they get that stuff from? But there's a potential problem. Jeremiah 2.13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. There's some families that are looking the wrong direction. They're, they're, they're looking for their strength in the wall or the army or their bank account or, or how much stuff they have or how big their house is or how big their pension fund is. And, 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 and they're, they, they've turned away from the rivers of living water. When the stock market goes up, they get a smile that goes down, they frown. 
but for the true Christian who's feasting at the table of Almighty God. It's not circumstances, it's Christ. It's built on Christ, amen? And they have that refreshing waters. And, and the third great truth, we have victory in Jesus. Can y'all say that with me? I have victory in Jesus. Say that with me. I have victory in Jesus. That's what the Bible says. Not because of what you've done, but because Jesus Christ, when he was crucified, rolled the stone away and got up out of that tomb. Therefore, we have victory in Jesus Christ. If you will just realize it. Verse 8 of Psalm 46. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. The Bible states in Isaiah 37 after Hezekiah and Isaiah had their prayer meeting. After they laid the letter on the altar and said, God, you hear what they're saying about you? They say, you have no power. We think you do. They say, you can't beat them. We think you can. Isaiah 37, verse 36, then the angel of the Lord went forth. One angel, one, the angel of the Lord went forth smote the camp of the Assyrians and a hundred and four score and 85. 185,000 Assyrians were slain one night by one angel. <laughs> and they arose early in the morning and behold, they were all dead corpses. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt in Nineveh until his own sons rose up and assassinated him. What can my God not do? <laughs> one angel, just one. And he was probably not even a general. He was probably a private. <laughs> Took out 185,000. Tell me your problem's bigger than an army of 185,000 Assyrians. One, one. In one night, that's what my God can do. Verse 9 of Psalm 46, he maketh wars to cease in the end of the earth. He breaks the bow, he cuts the spear, he burns the chariot in fire. Be still, just be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen, I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah, so there, what do you think about that? That's what Selah means. Did you know that? So there, what do you think about that? That was the top number one song of the day when the Assyrians were standing outside. So here's my question. Are you trusting the Lord today? Or are you trusting in other things? You said, have you heard what they say about us? Oh, God, you're better than that. And I trust you. My joy does not come from the circumstances. My joy comes from those rivers of living water that come forth out of my stomach, out of my belly. And they just don't quit. They just don't quit. I want to tell you something, dear friends. It's time to quit compromising with the devil. It's time to throw yourself into this thing called Christianity. It's time to stand on the wall and start shouting back, you can't have my family. You can't have my family. You can't have my kids. You can't have my city. This is ours. We've claimed it for Jesus. And you can't have it. And it's time for me to quit compromising. It's time to stand up and to trust my God. And if you will, if you will, you will see things that you will say, behold, come and see what the Lord has done. Behold, man can't do this. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of seeing what man can do. I want to see what God can do, amen? amen? I'm expecting the miraculous. I'm expecting God to heal some families that the lawyer said there's no way these people can get along. I'm expecting to see some young people that have been captured by drugs to say, listen, I don't need those drugs anymore. I need Jesus. I want to put my life off that sinking sand and put it on a solid rock from this day forward. I'd love to see some people say, listen, it's time to clean up this temple called my body. I need to lay some things at this altar and never pick them back up. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and to close your eyes. Billy's going to come and lead us in a hymn of invitation. Heavenly Father, you either are our strength and our refuge or you are not. 
This is not a gray area. God, I pray today that each person within the listening of my voice has knelt their knee and said, Lord, I surrender myself to your lordship. God, I'm not going to fight anymore. I'm going to let you do my fighting for me. God, I'm not going to fight with my wife. I'm not going to scream and holler at her. God, I'm going to pray for her. Oh, God, there are people that would like to harm us. God, would you please take care of them? God, would you put your hand on us and guide us and may, no matter what the circumstances, that we trust you and realize that you're in control. We love you, God, and thank you for giving us that victory. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Guys, this morning we have a, a time of decision. It's an opportunity for you to respond if God's spoken to your heart. You may be here this morning and say, you know, I am a Christian. I've given my heart to Jesus, but I've been compromising with the devil. And when I compromise, the things that are suffering are my prayer life, my evangelism, my witness, the things I've been doing for the Lord's house and church and my family. And I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. Isn't it come, time to come to the altar and just kneel down and say, God, I'm ready to recommit my life to you. Nobody's going to bother you. Nobody's going to get you to fill out little cards. It's just a great place to get some things right with God this morning. Maybe you're here and you say, Brother Sam, we've been looking for a church home like this. We really want to come and get involved in the ministry of Flint Baptist Church. We'll have decision counselors down here at the front. All you've got to do is come to one of them and say, listen, God's leading us to become a member of this church. They'll show you what to do. But the most important decision, listen to me. Have you given your heart and life to Jesus Christ? Because that's the most important thing. You can come to church all you want to. You can turn into a pew. But until you've given your heart to Jesus... If you were to die, you would not spend eternity in heaven with God. Do you know Jesus? It changed your life. It changed your attitude. It changed your family. I'd love to introduce you to my Jesus. So I'm going to ask you to stand, please. Billy's going to lead us in hymn of invitation. Prayer warriors, I need you to be praying all over this church building. As we begin to sing, would you come? Would you come as we sing? You come.